Hey guys, Jason Sational here, coming at you with the highly awaited Yasuo Katarina deck guide. Now, for those of you who might be unfamiliar, I brought this deck that I'm about to show you to the Monuments of Paris Seasonal Tournament and managed to get to the top 16 in NA playing this deck, just to give myself and a deck a little bit more credibility, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, if you like this kind of content, please like and sub subscribe and leave a comment telling me what you enjoyed or didn't. This is my first video, and I put a lot of effort into it, so I hope you enjoy. So, let's just go over the basic concepts of Yasuo Katarina as a deck. It's not an aggro deck in the normal sense like Pirates or Fearsomes, and it's not necessarily a control deck either, like uh, Shadow Isles Freljord. But it falls somewhere in between with the ability to apply pressure with scaling units, while also controlling the game with uh, some of your bigger stun cards. If you like watching Yasuo slice apart enemy minions and constantly attacking with overstatted minions, this is a deck for you. So just go to go over the deck list of this deck that I have in front of you, I'll only talk about any of the cards I have a three of, as I see them core to this deck. Any of the other deck cards that I don't have a three of, I'll explain some of the reasoning for why they're ratioed in that certain way. But let's start with the champions. Uh, of course, you have your three Yasos. That's kind of a given and one of the namesakes of this deck. But uh, three Katarinas may seem a little weird to some. In every other variant of this deck that I tested out, I always had two Katarinas, as sometimes uh, dr double drawing Katarina often isn't what you're looking for. However, I feel that Katarina is just so key in some of the matchups that it felt justified as uh, having three copies of it. For the minions, we have three copies of Fae Blade Twirler and Legion General. These are your heavy hitters and uh, what I believe to be the strongest minions in this deck that really help to apply pressure to the opponent. But being able to play Fae Blade Twirler on curve with stuns and recalls in hand is just so necessary to apply pressure. And later on, on turn 5, you can drop a 6-6 six, six or bigger Legion General with Fearsome that can just beat up some decks on ladder. Spell-wise, we see that we have 3 Flocks and 3 Palms. Flock being a 1-mana deal 4 is just too powerful to not have a 3 of, and Palm uh, is able to generate a body and act as a stun, which is something that this deck really wants. Otherwise, the rest of the deck is built around to synergize with Yasuo and to protect the units with cards such as Deny, Nopify, and Recall. Uh, I will really quickly touch up on why Recall is a 2 of in this deck and why I think it's just so good in this deck as well. Uh, not only can Recall bounce your stun cards like Arachnoid Sentry, Mina Swiftfoot, and Concussive Palm to be replayed and act as a second stun, they can also be used very cheaply to save a key unit like Yasuo, Katarina, or Legion General. In addition, uh, Recall also helps you to progress your Yasuo level up, which can sometimes be really important. Uh, overall, I played 106 decks, or sorry, 106 games with this deck. Uh, you heard me right, uh, 106 games in preparation for the top 32s. So hopefully I uh, know what I'm talking about with this deck. When I started playing this deck, uh, I started in, in, in Diamond and actually went 16-4 to get to Masters, which is, which is an 80% win rate. And during Masters, I went 41 to 35. In the seasonal tournament, including the qualifiers and the top 32, I went 6-3 with Yasuo Katarina and this deck list I see in front of you. So this is actually a very strong deck, definitely not a meme deck by any standards, and is definitely competitive on ladder, being a so somewhat underrepresented deck. Now... Just taking a look at the deck, there are two main win conditions. Uh, those obviously being Yasuo and Katarina. First, there's Yasuo. Yasuo brings the stun cards to a new level, making them deal 2 damage in addition to their stun effect. In an aggressive matchup, Yasuo can help you to stay ahead on board using your stun cards to pick off enemy minions. 
and when Yasuo is leveled, these stuns start dealing 5 damage, which can really kill most units in a, an aggressive deck. And sometimes when you have Yasuo down on board and you play an intimidating roar, uh, that can sometimes just wipe your opponent's board and just make you jump so far ahead in tempo in a situation where you probably just win that game outright. Uh, what's really key about stuns in general is that they can be used in a way that really punishes your opponent for developing on board. When you play a card like Arachnoid Sentry or Concussive Palm, uh, not only do they stun an enemy for that turn, they also generate a body in which can block a second unit during the attack. And if your opponent uh, tries to play around developing their board and open attacking, there's still the fast speed of Concussive Palm, which can help to shut down a weak attack. So opponents are left uh, figuring out if it's right to develop or try to open attack based on what cards that you have in your hand. However, it's important to note that stun cards aren't a form of removal themselves, and it requires Yasuo on board in order to turn these stuns into like a Mystic Shot. And for the, some games where you don't draw Yasuo, your opponent builds up a board state turn after turn because these stuns aren't actually doing anything to remove the enemy cards. And this is where Katarina comes in and cue the offensive power. Rally is one of the most powerful mechanics in the game, especially when it's paired with quick attackers and big minions. And the two most notable minions in this deck that really synergize well with Katarina are Fade Blade Twirler and Legion General. A leveled up Katarina on three paired with a Fade Blade Twirler on board can sometimes just outright win the game against slower decks. Each time Katarina strikes, it's also important that that in itself is a recall, which when attacking with a Fade Blade Twirler on the same turn, Katarina strikes, recalls the hand, and buffs the Fade Blade Twirler in the same attack. Uh, by turn 8, you could have like a 6-6 six, six Legion General with an 8-3 Fade Blade Twirler with Quick Attack, and you're able to play Katarina twice on a turn, meaning that you can effectively attack three times with these big quick attackers and that can really just help shut down your opponent because they're forced to block with their minions. Uh, an honorable side mention to Katarina is that its level 1 variant actually generates a fleeting blade's edge in hand and this card uh, can't be ignored because it can so importantly uh, be used to ping an enemy minion and help Proc, Ravenous Flock, for example, or even be used as one of the two spells that you want to play in a turn to help cheapen Deep Med for the next turn. And while this deck is flexible because you can play to its two win conditions, it also has a one really big shortfall, which is a lack of a good card draw or consistency. As I mentioned before, in some games, you just won't draw Yasuo to make your stuns effective in a control plan. But with Katarina in this deck, your stuns can help you to close out the game aggressively uh, by helping to buff your Fate Blade Thriller and your Legion Generals. For this reason, uh, sorry, for the same reason that you have a limited card draw, you're kind of restricted in building this deck in a certain way. Uh, Cards like Steel Tempest or Yone can be great because they're really efficient stun cards. But without a Yasuo on board, these stuns don't really do anything besides the turn they are played. It also means that you can't go all in with the Yasuo stun plan. That's one of the key reasons why you might see Yone or Steel Tempest as a one of in this deck. And in addition, there's some stun cards like Guile, which is a noxious one mana stun card that just really didn't see fit into this kind of deck. There's not as much room for synergistic cards uh, to pair with Yasuo because some games you just have really hard time drawing. Uh, in addition, uh, you're also reliant on a lot of top decks in certain games. If the game drags on past turn eight, you might be uh, hoping that each top deck actually does something. 
for that reason, you also can't be drawing something uh, that's unsubstantial. So by turn eight, you don't really want to be drawing a card like Steel Tempest, which only stuns an attacking minion. That's why you see some big cards in this deck, like two of, of Mina Swiftfoot, as well as a one of Captain Farron. Uh, and the last thing is, unlike other slower control decks like Feel the Mina, which we've recently seen a surge in popularity in the tournament scene, uh, or like other Ionia decks, uh, this deck can only really afford to run a few tech cards because in some matchups, uh, your hand might be clogged with uh, just dead cards or uh, the inability to draw them. So we can't be running three denies, three will of uh, three nopifies, uh, because sometimes they're just sitting dead in our hand, and this deck just can't really allow that. Originally, uh, I also had a one of copy of might, which is a plus three attack with overwhelm, and it's a noxion spell. However, sometimes it just caught caught got caught dead in my hands. And while it was really powerful in certain situations, the drawback of having a dead card in your hand uh, just made me think about cutting it. Now, let's talk a little bit about matchup spreads. And this is during my 106 games I played in the Monuments of Power meta. So uh, on the left, we have our favorables, and on the right, we have our unfavorables. Uh, Yasuo Katarina's number one weakness are decks that have damage-based removal or barriers to shut down quick attacks, and remove Katarina before she has the opportunity to, to strike and level up. Uh, for the current meta, those main decks are Draven Ezreal and Fiora Shen. Now, Ash Frostbite is also a problem, as any sort of Frostbite or Freezes also shuts down our quick attackers, but that deck isn't so prevalent right now. Um, with a lack of consistent draw, your bailout cards like Notify, Deny, and Recall have to really be used sparingly and on certain cards in certain situations, which is kind of a hard thing to really uh, get the hang of. But on the upside is that single target base removal has a much worse time against Yasuo Katarina. Uh, because we have cards like Deny, uh, that can help to shut down a Rumination or a Vengeance. Or even if you don't have a Deny in hand, if your opponent plays Vengeance on, say, your Legion General, you can use your one mana recall to save your Legion General, then replay it on the same turn, and you're still up one mana from that exchange. For this reason, Yato Katarina can do really well against Go Hard and Feel the Rush decks that rely on either these really expensive removal cards or have slow removal cards that can't really stop Katarina. And for a similar reason, decks like uh, Tom Soraka, which only don't really have a way of interacting with your board, and some aggro decks like Fearsomes have a hard time stopping Katarina from leveling up and can often get out pressured as a result. So another popular question I get is why not pair Yasuo with Swain and with Katarina? The answer goes back to the issue of Ionia Noxus as a region combination, in that they're lacking a lot of card draw. Yasuo Swain will most likely win by having a leveled up Swain and a Leviathan on board. And now if there is a Yasuo also on board with the Swain and Leviathan, this can often be a very devastating late game board wipe. However, Yasuo Swain relies even more heavily on drawing Yasuo in order to have damage dealt towards the Swain level up. Stun cards only synergize with Swain so long as there is a Yasuo on board, unless you're also trying to cheese the opponent by getting a Nexus Strike with Swain. Uh, now, in another in situation, you have a Leviathan on board with the Yasuo, but no Swain, and that doesn't really synergize with the Yasuo either. 
Whereas uh, stuns with Katarina don't require you to have Yasuo because the stuns are still buffing your cards like the Blade Twirlers and Legion Generals. And with Katarina, you can be attacking multiple times per turn to make use of these stuns in order to apply a lot of pressure to close out games. There's no, there's no doubt that Yasuo Swain has a much stronger control and late game than Yasuo Katarina, but by giving up Katarina, you also lose some of those matchups against slower decks where you can really rush out the opponent. Now, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover with this deck. Uh, I went through a lot of information, and hopefully you found this informative and interesting. Uh, I'll leave you with four uh games that I picked out that really showcase some of the strengths and weaknesses to this deck. Uh, I hope that you enjoy them. Thank you. So our first matchup that we have here is against Fiora Shen. Now this is one of our harder matchups uh, as I explained a little bit earlier. Fiora Shen has the access to cards like Repost that really shut down some of these quick attackers. Uh, so just quickly look at the mulligan here, I see Fate Blade Twirler and Yasuo, so kind of a very flexible opening hand. Uh, we have the ability, if we draw a couple stuns, to really apply pressure with the Fate Blade Twirler, and we also have the Yasuo in case we need, uh, just to have a little bit of damage when we're eventually stunning Fiora to prevent any of the level up to happen. So we see here, uh, the opponent doesn't have one drop or two drops, so I feel pretty comfortable develop developing this 1-3 here. Uh, w without any stuns, this 1-3 doesn't do too much. And when Fiora comes down, that's kind of scary because Fiora's a 3-3, three, three, can just freely challenge the 1-3 that I have here. But uh, it's very important to note that because he played this 2 on Fleet Feather Tracker, it means that he doesn't have a Fiora in hand. So I can safely develop the other 1 3 here as well. And uh, just one really key thing to think about during these Fiora Shen matchups is just what kind of hands they could be on. I mentioned earlier that in, by playing this one drop on turn three, it means that they don't have a Fiora in hand. Uh, and we just see this two drop being played as well. Um, so we have to think about what kind of spells he has in his hands and what kind of attacks we can safely make. So we know he plays a Shen here. He has three mana, which really limits him to only something like a sharp sight or a single combat. I'm thinking about his roar, which could just immediately stop his attack, but if he has a single combat, he just gets a free trade on one of my blade twirlers before the stuns go off. So I just opt to take a slightly slower play and play Yasuo here. Now, the Intimidating Roar could have been good here, uh, it could just force out a single combat, and he's at 3 mana, so there's no access to anything like a Deny, uh, which is really important to think about uh, how much mana your opponent has and what kind of cards he has to play around. So he challenges the Yasuo here, I'm pretty fine. The difference between 2 health and 4 health is really not that big in this matchup. Um, of course, if he wants a single combat, the 2-1 into my Yasuo, that kind of sucks. Uh, we see a good top deck here with the Arachnoid Sentry. I'll just take the... I use the Sentry here just as li like a 3-mana Mystic Shot uh, on the 2-1 Challenger, just so that I can clear that off the board. Uh, he either chooses not to protect there, just lets it go, but either way, the stun goes through. And as you can see, my Blade Twirlers are buffed by 2 attack. And this is a pretty decent board state right now. We'll see what he plays. At 5 mana, it could be like the Screeching Dragon. Uh, we saw earlier that he opted to play a 1-drop and a 2-drop earlier, um, so his hand could be pretty spell-heavy. And we see that he just drops another Bright Steel here to progress towards his Shen level up. And so his hand's mostly probably reactive spells, 
or big minions that cost six or more. Now he did have the Fiora here, which is kind of weird. I think it was drawn two turns ago. Uh, a little surprised he didn't play it earlier, but this Fiora on board with the Shen is really scary because it just allows him to pick off one of my units for free. And he goes for the Yasuo here. I will block one of the Bright Seals with my Arachnoid Sentry, and I'll opt to use uh, Spirit's Refuge to protect my Yasuo from this extreme. Uh, Yasuo's decent here. Uh, we, I do have the Roar in hand, which could damage some of these minions here, so keeping it alive. Uh, there's some merit. And this also prevents the Fiora from getting one kill this turn. It's taking a while to think. And so he goes for the Shen Stand United. Uh, kind of a weird play to use it so proactively. And only to really save the 3-2 and push for extra points of damage. But I'm pretty happy that he just spends his mana so uh, freely here. And now that he's back down to 3 mana, he's very limited in his options into React. And so I take this Intimidating Roar here to really buff up my Fade Blade Twirlers and also progress my Yasuo. And now if he doesn't single combat here, uh, I can safely assume that he doesn't have in hand. And we also see that there's no sharp sight here, but sharp sight will only really protect the 3 2, and I can't totally rule it out of his hand. But now this hand board, or my board state is really scary. I have these big quick attackers, and I have Katarina coming down. Now, this Katarina is actually kind of funny. Uh, the blade's edge in this particular instance can pop. Uh, like a barrier, or I could have, or I could just go for this ping on the Fiora before I attack. But let's just see what I decide to do first. Our opponent plays a Laurent Challenger, dropping down to six mana. And I just go for full attack here. It's very hard to play around cards like Rapaz in this matchup. And uh, in this situation, I just don't think I can not attack with my Blade Twirlers and Yasuo. Uh, simply because I am the one that kind of needs to pressure out this game. So he does have the Rapaz here, which protects his Fiora, but... Uh, very conveniently, I have a Blaze Edge that can easily just pop the barrier and uh, get a really good exchange. I use one mana, or he used four mana. And so if, it, if, if our opponent lets us through, he pretty much loses. And so we see that he has a Nopify, which is also another really great card to see. Uh, out of our opponent. Now he's at zero mana, I might as well just save the Yasuo here, prevent Fiora from leveling up. And by doing so, I actually level up my Yasuo. The recall also <laughs> funnily buffs my Blade Twirlers here, but uh, at this moment, he has blockers and I don't really have a way of getting through here. But most importantly, I level up uh, I level up my Katarina, and this is where things get really scary. I can play Katarina every turn, and these 13 threes are quick attacking and challenging my opponent. But of course, it's his turn. Uh, he gets a pretty free trade here on one of my Blade Twirlers, and I can't really do too much against it. Uh, the decision to recall it here is kind of unnecessary. Um, it could be used better on one of my more important minions, but I use it anyway just to make sure that there's no way he can win this game by cheesing a Fiora on me. And we actually force out a single combat here, which is really good because the barrier Fiora represents 6 damage. Uh, and I can't really stop that unless I commit this deny. 
and or as if he had let the recall go through and I played something like Yasuo, he could uh, single combat after combat and use the barrier to kill my Yasuo for free. Uh, I decided to pass here instead of playing Katarina just so I can have Deny up. Uh, and this is a really good open attack anyway. And we'll see what he does with his mana. He doesn't really have good blocks, but he's committing to these blocks, uh, meaning that he has a way to stop them. Or he's just trying to soak up damage. We see his Spirit's Refuge on Shen. And he also has the Repost for Fiora. And this is kind of unfortunate because... Like I said earlier, barriers uh, really shut down some of these quick attackers, and he just gets two pretty free trades on my cards. Uh, Fiora levels up here, which is he's two out of four with a Shen on board, which is pretty scary. So uh, this is actually a, kind of a bad board state for me. Uh, he But he's down to one card, so it's very unlikely that he has a really clean way to win this. The Minotaur Reckoner comes down to stun the Shen, and he drops uh, Bright Steel Legion. And this is where Mina uh, really comes into handy. Your uh, my opponent committed nine mana to play this Bright Steel, and this Mina also costs nine, but also sends back the Shen and the Fiora back into hand. Uh, very critically, we both have thirteen mana, so we both have mana up for a nine drop and deny. So if he denied my Mina here, I could deny his deny, and this would go through. We see that it's not a deny, or at least he would have tried maybe, uh, and then I would just deny his deny. And obviously, we have a really free open attack here. It's really important to take these open attacks when they're clean, especially when you have a leveled up Katarina in hand, because. Uh, Katarina really doesn't punish open attacks as much in these later turns, especially when you can play Katarina twice per turn. He replaces Shen. Uh, he knows that he has to play down minions in order to chump block some of these quick attackers, and this is where uh, things really shine for me. He can't play his uh, Bright Steel down because uh, he'd be out of mana. Uh, he drew another Protector here to buff the Shen, which would block one of my attackers, but luckily I drew one of these palms. And these palms can be used aggressively as well just to take out one of these units from combat, especially when one of these units has barrier, and he's very limited on spells and units. And so he drops a concede here knowing that he can't win. Uh, overall, this is a very uh, draw-based match, and uh, I was able to overwhelm him because I got a Katarina level up down. So we're coming up to our second matchup, which is against Tom Soraka. One of the key things to note in this deck, or against this matchup, is that Tom Soraka really has very limited ways of interacting with your end of the board, that mainly being uh, through Tom by swallowing some of your units, or uh, possibly if they run Shakedown as a card, which they can challenge, grant vulnerable to your minions and challenge them. Uh, I see in my hand Fade Blade Twirler and Katarina, and this is this makes me really happy. This combo uh, is what allows this deck to really turn on the pressure and begin to start chucking damage at the opponent's face very fast and very quickly. And uh, even more importantly, I'm attacking on odds, meaning that I get to attack when I play my Katarina. So our opponent skips his turn 1 and on turn 2 drops a Star Spring, uh, which is a little scary. Uh, this matchup could end either way depending on the card draws. Um, and so that's just something to look out for. He does have Star Spring on curve, meaning that he gets the maximum value out of it. And on turn three, drops a Soraka. Now, this block is very strange because I have a flock in hand, and killing off Soraka is so huge in this matchup. Uh, because it's their main draw engine. And as you saw, as Katarina struck, she leveled up and recalled, which meant that my Fade Blade Twirler also got a plus 2 attack buff. 
meaning that it got to strike the Nexus for three. And this is where the combo really comes in, because each time you strike with the Fiora, your Fade Blade Twirlers also scale with more uh, damage. He plays his Tom on curve as well, and I have a little bit of decision to make. Now I could play my Katarina here and maybe go for another attack, but my Katarina only deals 3 and my Fade Blade Twirler only deals 5 after the Katarina strikes, meaning that Tom can block both and start healing up with the Star Spring. And what's worse is that if he has an Astral Protection in hand, uh, he gets uh, additional value out of it towards his Star Spring. So, in this case, I just opt to play Arachnoid Sentry just to get a plus 2 damage boost to my Fade Blade Twirler. And this means that when I play Katarina again next turn, the Fade Blade Twirler will scale up to 7 damage, meaning that uh, he can't block with Tom. And when I see the second flock draw, uh, I can take this a little bit more aggressively. Uh, I mean, if he blocks either of my units here, I have the option to flock his Tom Kench. And if he doesn't have an answer, like a Guiding Touch or a Astral Protection Hand, then killing the Tom as well really shuts down his game plan. He plays a 4-drop here, meaning that he only has 2 mana, which is really important, because uh, in his position, he really has to be playing defensively and pr proactively, and it, he plays his Guiding Touch and he's just out of mana. His Tom Kench dies to this attack and my Katarina just deals 4 damage to his minion. And now at this point he realizes he can't win and takes a concede. And this just really shows how powerful turn 2 Blade Twirler with turn 3 Katarina can be. So for our third matchup here, we're up against Ash Nox, which is also a, quite a challenging matchup to face. Ash Nox has access to Frostbite cards, which can really shut down some of our quick attackers, most notably Brittle Steel, which is a one mana card that can Frostbite uh, attacker with three or less health, and our Fade Blade Twirlers critically have three health, meaning that there can be some very unfavorable exchanges for me. Now in this hand, I have a Flock which I kept from the Mulligan, because in these mid-range matchups, Flock can be so powerful by killing a damaged Yeti. Uh, and I choose to opt to play the House Spider first here, uh, simply because it's two bodies for one, and in this mid-range matchup, I know I'll have to chump out some bigger units. Uh, for example, a 5-5 Yeti that could come down on turn 4. And I attack with the 2-2 two, two only because I don't want to trade the 1-1 one, one for his 1-1. One, one. He plays a lot bigger he plays a lot bigger units than I do, and this 1-1 one, one can get more value than simply trading for another 1-1. One, one. He plays a trapper, uh, and I have to expect that he's gonna be drawing a 5 mana 5-5 five, five soon. Now I can pretty safely play Katarina here, even though Katarina striking will result in negative tempo. I do have two Fade Blade Twillers I can play on the following turn, which uh, if Katarina strikes they turn into 3-3 three, three quick attackers, which against his current board state right here is pretty powerful. And funnily enough, this Blade Edge allows me to threaten this 3-3, three, three, which actually forces out a Brittle Steel from him. And I'm pretty happy to see that because that Vidal Steel could have been used to stop the Katarina from striking. And importantly, when the Katarina doesn't strike, she doesn't level up and doesn't recall. Which means that she won't uh, buff my Fade Blade Twirlers either. Now, uh, I was going to commit to the two Fade Blade Twirlers here, or I could play Yasuo first, but... Uh, he had the opportunity to draw his 1 mana 5-5, five five. and if he had a Brittle Steel in combination with the Yeti, he could kill my Katarina. And recognizing that if he kills my Katarina, that kind of puts a dent into my game plan. Now, if he did the same play with his 3-2 Trapper with a Brittle Steel, I actually have Flock here which could kill the Trapper instead of allowing it to block a Frozen Katarina. And if he blocks with the 1-1, then it only deals 1 damage to my Katarina, which in this matchup against Ash and Ox, they don't really have ways of dealing damage to my minions. 
and that's why I didn't play my Fade Blade Trollers before I attacked with Katarina, even though I could have gone a buff with them. And so he plays a Rhyme Fame Wolf, which is kind of a surprising card to see here because it sometimes isn't in many Ash Nox decks. But in this current board state, a 4 3 Challenger is staring down my 1 3 Fade Blade Trollers, and that's really scary. And so. Uh, I opt to just go to kill it, because I can't really have this challenging two of my units. It's taking a while. Uh, not sure what the opponent's thinking about here, but this Concussive Palm allows me to generate a 3-2 body, which does really well in blocking the Trapper. Uh, he doesn't play his Yeti here, uh, perhaps it could still be the, uh, the top card on his deck, but instead goes to play uh, Ice Veil Archer just to ensure that I can't block with my uh, Tail of Dragon this turn. I say Mana for Flock here just in case. Uh, and he only commits to attacking with the 3-2. Uh, and now, I can block this 3-2 here. Because once I replay Katarina, I do get a bl another Blade's Edge, which can be used to ping it down. So, setting it to 1 health is actually pretty important. So I drew a Legion general here, it's only a 6-6 six, six for 5, uh, and, so, and I know I can get it scaled up a little bit higher uh, with my Katarina. And so he does play Yeti that he just drew, and so my predictions are right, meaning that he didn't draw his Yeti in the past 2 turns. Uh, I take the Blade's Edge first so that he can't use it to block, and i probably remove it later. This Reckoning kind of catches me a little off guard because I don't really face enough Ash Nox decks on ladder and I wasn't really expecting this card. And so this is a little unfortunate on my end uh, that his 1 mana 5-5 five, five got to clear my entire board. Uh, taking this path is a little bit strange but developing either of my minions doesn't really represent a good blocker against this 5-5. Five, five. And so, it do, in, in the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, but I don't really have any spells that capitalize on this spell mana, so this pass was actually a misplay. So he, he actually develops a beard before attacking, uh, which allows me to actually play my Arachnoid Sentry and actually shut down the attack from both of these attackers. Um, but I, I think at this point, uh, taking 9 damage is fine. This deck doesn't really have overwhelms unless they're a version that plays cards like Captain Farron, for example. And so, uh, if I take 9 damage here, uh, I'm not really afraid of him having any cards that could threaten my life total. And I, at this point, I'm kind of running low on value, so I want my stuns to be dealing 2 damage as well as stunning them. And so I wait until Yasuo is on the board before I want to consider playing my Arachnoid Sentry. And in, in this case, you can see that uh, I'm quickly running low on cards, which is one of the main weaknesses to this deck in that there's no good card draw mechanic in Noxus or Ionia. Uh, so I have to play very sparingly for value, and uh, at this point I'm really scared of another Reckoning, uh, and hopefully he doesn't really have one, but he wouldn't really have committed the Archer onto my Yasuo, because Reckoning could have wiped them all out, so I think that it's safe to assume that he doesn't have uh, another Reckoning in hand. Uh, and at this point, we're most both mostly relying on our top decks. Um, I think at this point, because he has access to Trifarian Assessor, which can draw cards, and I don't have card draw, I think it's pretty critical that I act as the aggressor uh, in this current state of the match. And so I opt to play for tempo by playing the Legion General instead of the Katarina. Uh, at this point, it's it's pretty safe to assume that he doesn't have a Reckoning, uh, and 
because he doesn't, uh, I'm pretty uh, happy to say the least. But he does have the Sejuani, which he goes after my Yasuo. I use Deep Med looking to grab a stun in case he wants to challenge my Yasuo, which I do find here. And I think it's pretty important to protect the Yasuo at this point, uh, simply because any stuns I top deck, I want to be having Yasuo on board in order to capitalize off of it, and by dealing 2 damage to with the stuns as well. So I just take the time to develop out my board. At this point, I can't be worrying about a reckoning top deck, and I want these Fade Blade Fillers to start scaling with my stuns. Um, and I'll take this problem to protect my Yasuo, because if I top deck, like, a Yone, having this Yasuo on board is really gonna help out. Um, he has the Harsh Winds here, which he uses on defensive, uh, to save his Yeti from this trade. And I'm pretty happy about this, because Harsh Winds is one of the strongest cards to shut down my Fate Blade Twillers, and to use aggressively with Ash. And so seeing it on the defensive here, uh, being used in a way that doesn't even kill me, I'm pretty happy to see. And now we're both running low on cards, I have to close this game out pretty soon, uh, because he might draw an Assessor. So I play Katarina here and go for pretty much a full attack with all of my quick attackers. He's very running low on cards, and because he used the Harsh Winds last turn, uh, there's a lot less freezes I have to play around. So I feel pretty fine committing to this full attack here. He uses his Ice Sail Archers to block, and uh, I could've... Uh, you know, use the blade's edge to ping down on these three ones so that there'd be one less blocker. But again, uh, a top deck draw of uh, Reckoning would kind of end me. Uh, but I do have this deny in hand. He actually has a second Harsh Winds in hand, which kind of sucks. I don't really have any way of stopping it. And he stops both my Katarina and kills my Yasuo here. Uh, and, and that really kind of shuts down my offensive. Uh, the Yasuo going down uh, isn't the worst because I don't have any stuns that really capitalizes on Yasuo's damage. Um, but at this point, we're both very low on cards, but I have a better board state than him, and so I'm feeling okay. He passes, and just debating where this blade edge goes. Uh, I could lower Sejuani's health just a little bit so that I can trade with the 3 2 tail, but ultimately I'll have to just ping and damage the beard so that if I do draw a Ravenous Flock, for example, uh, I can use it on the beard if needed. And like I said before, when this deck really relies on these top decks, you really need some big hitters. And this is where the 1 of Farron comes into play really really hard. 8-8 uh, eight, eight Overwhelm that generates 12 points of direct damage to the enemy Nexus is just so huge because this deck also lacks any ways of healing health and so all I have to do is get 3 more damage to his Nexus and I basically win. Knowing that he played both his Harsh Winds the turns before means that this 8-8 eight, eight actually gets uh, to attack and hit the Nexus. Now he doesn't play any cards, it's really strange here, have being on full spell mana. And so, uh, most, mostly, most likely, the two remaining cards that he has in hand are most likely reactive combat tricks. And so I don't really see any point in saving any of my mana, and so I just use it efficiently here by playing the Decimate. Knowing that his hand is mostly combat tricks, uh, and uh, he already played his Harsh Winds, I'm not very scared of what's left in his hand, so I take this open attack here. And just really important to recap, all I need to do is deal 3 damage to his face, and I win. And he also has to block pretty much my whole attack here in order to even survive this attack, assuming he doesn't have any freezes. You could have a third Harsh Winds? And so he kind of tries to take some value blocks here with the beard, 
trying to soak 3 damage with the Yeti from the Farron, but these Blade Twirlers are still looking really scary. And so he did have a Brittle Steel here, which you can trade off, uh, and he actually has a Colon Strike, which I could deny if I wanted to, but I'm already pushing enough damage here for the Destiny to go through, and the opponent recognizes this as well, and competes. So a very uh, drawn out matchup. It's very important to know when to use your resources and design your deck in a way such that you have your strong top decks. And so for our last matchup here, we are up against Discard Aggro. <coughs> and Discard Aggro is usually a good matchup. They usually go really wide with low attack units. And so uh, a Yasuo with an Intimidating Roar can sometimes just close out the game. But Discard Aggro also has the ability to go really, really fast, and sometimes they might even set you in a position uh, where you're pretty much going to lose even before you have a chance to play your Yasuo here. And uh, this deck list is slightly different. I had one Zed in this version, um, but the general game plan, how you would play this out, is still very similar. So our opponent passed turn 1 here, which I'm pretty happy about. This deck really wants to be playing on curve every turn, and him skipping his turn 1 means that he can't also double play 1 drops on turn 2, meaning that he has a much slower start, and I'm pretty happy about. Now how Spider is still a decent 2 drop to play out here, he's dealing 3 damage, uh, but not having the 1 drop, like it's on a Urchin, uh, prevents an additional 2 damage here. And what's somewhat important to consider in this matchup is that I am attacking on even, meaning that uh, when I attack on turn 3, uh, Arachnoid Sentry becomes a really awkward card to play because you don't really want to be stunning aggressively so early on. And that's why Zed was in some of my earlier decks, Zed being a good proactive 3 drop that you can play on 3 and actually does something. Compared to something like Arachnoid Sentry, when played on 3 and you don't have a Fade Blade Twirler in hand, that can just feel really bad. Uh, so I'm pretty happy to play this Zed here, and he does have a Mystic Shot here. I could recall the Zed, but... Uh, Zed doesn't really have much merit as a blocker, and so I wouldn't want to be playing him down next turn either. So I choose not to save the Zed here, and I can use the recall later on for a stun down the line. So again, like last turn, he didn't have any 1 draws before, maybe he has another 2 drop. Uh, it doesn't seem like he does. And on turn 4, he just plays a Draven, and this is where some of the stuns really come into handy against aggro. Uh, this Arachnoid Sentry acts like a 2 for 1 blocker. Uh, for this turn, it stuns Draven from attacking and acts as a blocker against this 2-2. Two -two. Now in this matchup, uh, 2 damage might be as much as I'm getting out of a blocker here, and so I'd rather just save his health now than uh, later. Um, but it's also important to know that stuns don't actually remove the enemy minion, rather they just act as a stall opportunity. Uh, and so as the turns go on, hopefully I can draw on Yasuo, because Yasuo really capitalizes on the stuns to actually turn them into removal. And now I have to play this Legion General here, even though it's a 5-5, five, five, I desperately need tempo onto this board. And I actually got a trade out of a Draven on his defensive turn, which I'm pretty happy about. Now this does also mean that he had to get excited in hand, and because I'm running low on uh, enemy, uh, <coughs> I'm running low on units myself, I decide to save this general which I can play back down as a 6-6 six, six and even block later minions. Him knowing that uh, it might actually even opt, uh, make him open attack, uh, and he does here, which uh, is really good because I can also have this palm to deny this Jinx from attacking. And so these stuns all <coughs> kind of act as a mind game where you have some of the slow speed stuns like Arachnoid Sentry that act as a 2 for 1 blocker. Uh, then you also have the fast speed stuns like palm that 
uh, not prevent the opponent from open attacking, but also having the slow sense pr to prevent the opponent from developing. And having this recall, I can just re save my palm, uh, sorry, my tail of the dragon, and replay it as a palm. Now, he's learning University of Piltover, which is a fun inclusion, but that also means that he's generating a lot of random cards and a lot of random vows, which can get scary at times. And if I don't remove this Jinx, I'm dead in four turns. Now it's a party. And this hand's looking pretty bad. Um, I'm probably gonna play the Legion General just for tempo. And that seems like what I end up doing. And because I got a few more stunts in between when I last played it, recalled it, and played it back down again, it's now an 8 8, which is actually pretty threatening. Especially with the fearsome, it can't be chumped out by this 1-1 one, one spider. Uh, he got a random wave rider, which blocked it for the turn. Uh, but we can see that he's uh, just generating random cards that sometimes can't really do anything. But importantly, he is getting a Jinx rocket every turn. And I finally draw Yasuo here, which uh, I'm really happy about because now I can start dealing with his board with my stuns, uh, even though I only have two in hand. And we'll just wait for him to take a look at his randomly generated cards. Uh, University of Piltover, uh, probably a really underplayed card. Uh, and uh, probably a lot higher in the meme potential than in the competitive potential, but seeing it played here was a little bit refreshing. He starts with a Jinx Rocket, maybe to pass, uh, pass initiative back to me. Either way, I think it's pretty clear that I'm playing Yasuo this turn, just so I can start capitalizing on some of my stunts. I'm actually opting to stun the Jinx first here. Um, maybe it's slightly disagreeable, um, but the Jinx attacking, I don't have the best of blocks, I guess. I did have the 1-1. One, one. I'm not too sure why I chose to stun it first. But he actually got a randomly generated Captain Fairy, which is kind of funny. Um, but it is important to note that his decimates actually get discarded by the University of Piltover, meaning that they don't really threaten me much, and uh, I can conveniently will back this Farron, which also gets discarded, meaning that it's not really that big of a threat to me. And now this Sentry actually kind of turned out okay. Um, because now I denied the attack with Jinx, and then he spent all of his men on the Farron, which I can just take out with the Will of Ionia. And then I can play Yasuo on the following turn. Now had I played Yasuo, made the same turn. Uh, Yasuo striking the Farron doesn't really do anything, and the Jinx getting the attack would just mean that uh, I would have to give up the 1-1 one, one Shadow Assassin as well. And as you can see here, his three decimates are gone, along with the Farron, and it's not much of a threat. But I do have to start killing this Jinx because he's already fired, uh, our opponents already fired two rockets at me, and after this rocket that he has in hand, I'll be back down to 8 health. Now, this Yasuo being leveled up is really huge, especially in some of these more aggressive matchups. These stuns being able to deal 5 damage instead of 2 means that any stuns turn into basically single target <coughs> unit removals, and which is really powerful. You can't really be playing around randomly generated cards, so I just developed the Fate Blade Twirler that gets a buff out of this Concussive Palm, and I go to kill the Jinx. He gets a get excited, which he uses to kill the general, which is fine. Looking at my hand state, uh, I'm pretty safe now. Uh, with the Yasuo on board, I can stabilize pretty easily. And with this Farron in hand, I can soon uh, just overwhelm him with damage. I just attack with the quick attackers, him being at 2 mana with 1 randomly generated card. He doesn't really have very good options, and so he just gives up 2 one, 1-1s one as chump blockers. 
and uh, at this point I'm feeling really comfortable. He's depending on randomly generated cards and top decks and double drawing Yasa here is actually really beneficial because it's an additional stun. He also is one of those champions where that you don't really feel too bad if you double draw it because the second Yasuo actually synergizes well with the first Yasuo. <laughs> and this block for me looks a little strange. Uh, I should have blocked the 2 1 with my Fae Blade Twirler and the 1 1 with my Tail. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure why I didn't do that. Now I'm motioning to play the Steel Tempest on the Senna here. Um, just so that I can save my 3-1. Ultimately, I want to be using my spells proactively uh, rather than so aggressively. He actually had an Elixir of Wrath, which is funny because it, it, it doesn't really punish my decision here. But he gets a pretty nice trade on the Fate Blade Twirler, and at this point, I just commit the Steel Tempest. Uh... And because the Paral Fly actually has Spell Shield, I can't save my <laughs> Fate Blade Twirler, which is pretty funny. He also got a Fury of the North, uh, which double acts as um, kind of a didn't really matter which minion I blocked what, but I could have Steel Tempest uh, a minion he buffed it later. But killing the Senna. Uh, did pretty much the same thing, and I have this Baron coming down that he can't stop, and uh, I'm pretty much in control of the game at this point. And the Icy on the Cake is this Intimidating Roar top deck because I can just wipe out his board. Uh, this Intimidating Roar basically allows me to push 3 extra damage, uh, because once he plays down another unit, He's most likely not going to use it to block with Farron, unless it has 5 or more health, and use it to block with Yasuo, meaning that I get a free attack with my sentry. He plays a Zonite and discards a strong arm, uh, and at this point, I'm already dealing lethal damage with these deathmates in hand, uh, but he did have a Whimsy, another really funny card. If he had blocked my 1-1 one -one and killed it here, I wouldn't be getting... Uh, Captain Fern back, and he only used this Whimsy card just to prevent 7 damage on this turn. Uh, and choosing to block the Yasuo instead to net him the highest health this turn. Um, but because this Whimsy wears off by the round end, I do get another Captain Fern back, and that pretty much cremates my victory on my next attack turn. So if the opponent doesn't win this turn, I uh, most likely win. So that's important to keep track of just uh, what turn you're going to win by and making sure that you do everything to not lose here. He gets a flock, which is really funny because it allows him to remove my Yasuo. Um, at this point I'm feeling very confident that his randomly generated cards can't beat me, so I can just commit this deny here. And if he has any other substantial cards, I do have a Concussive Palm in order to prevent him from potentially threatening lethal on me. But he has some really low value cards here. And again, because he's only dealing 1 damage this turn, uh, I know I'm not going to die. And so I can just use my cards proactively as much as I want this turn. And so I'll actually just use his Palm to save my 3-1 here. I could have blocked this 1-1. One, one. Uh... I believe it's the uh, maze, it's the mage seeker observant or something like that that generates a 6 plus cost spell in your hand. And I don't block him because he still had the mana to play it if he got it. And dealing 1 damage is fine because I'll kill him on the following turn. And then I just take this attack because this Farron uh, deals 6 damage at most and I have the decimates. And the opponent recognizes this and can see. 